Hi, it's Writing Wednesday, and I'm Janet Fitch, and I'll be your guide today. Uh, <laughs> um, we have talked a lot about character in Writing Wednesdays, and I wanted to um, delve into that a little deeper. I was digging out some old files, and I found some of the question and answer sessions that I've held with characters um, in, this was for um, Paint It Black, and I did this with all of my books. I've contacted my characters, I've asked them questions, and the better your questions, the better your book is going to be, your story is going to be, the more, uh, the deeper you understand your characters. Now I've suggested that everybody take a look at the three-dimensional character study in The Art of Dramatic Writing by Lagos Egri. Um, it's not great for uh, fiction writers in terms of theme. He's very big on theme, and uh, I don't believe that. Uh, I think that's putting the cart before the horse. I think first you have to kind of figure out what your story is and who your characters are and get through a draft or so before you start worrying about theme, which is basically what is theme is basically what the heck is this all about? So um, we're going to talk about how to interview your characters. Now first you'll do the character study hopefully. Uh, what happens is that most of us get to a point with our characters where we can, um, we, we know enough about them to get about 80 pages in, and then we get stuck and we freak out. Uh, and many a good book has been abandoned at 80 pages because uh, uh, the author has run out of what he knows or she knows about the character. So the first thing I say is to go to the Art of Dramatic Writing, take a look at the three-dimensional character study in this. So it's the physiology, the sociology, and the psychology of your characters. And you're going to fill that out, not only for your main character, but for all of your major characters, but especially your protagonist. And uh, so it's physiology is sex, you usually know right away, age, height, weight. Whoa, didn't think about that. Color of hair, eyes, skin, posture. Oh, how straight are they? How slumpy are they? Huge character difference. Uh, appearance, are they considered attractive or not? Um, are they neat? How's their hygiene? How's their health? Uh, what if, what illnesses do they tend to have when they're run down? Uh, what have they had when they were a child? Uh, birthmarks. Give your character some facial character, some facial or physical characteristics. Birthmarks, scars, that kind of thing. Uh, any abnormalities, physical abnormalities. Um, it's something the reader always remembers, you know, that character has a third nipple or that character, you know, cut half their fingertip off when they were in workshop in high school. Uh, they'll always remember that. Um, heredity, so what runs in the family for, you know, in the physical realm. Uh, where did they get their long toes? Where did they get their, you know, um, the curly eyelashes or whatever. Uh, then there's sociology. You want class. We you know, think about class. You know, what class are you in now? What class were you in as a child? You know, this all affects the characters. What is your occu your character's occupation? What was their family of origin? What were their parents' occupations? That gives you vocabulary. You know what language to use when you're talking, when you're using their thoughts. What kind of metaphors do they come up with? If your father was an iron worker, you're going to come up with interesting metaphors. If your mother was a cook, you're going to come up with interesting metaphors. So, you know, you really start to see your character the way human beings are layered and full of these, um, these little prisms. Um, what was their education? You know, what subject did they like? 
you're not going to put it in the story necessarily. Probably 90% chance you won't put in that your kid, your protagonist's favorite subject was art. But if it's a surprising thing, you can pull out a tiny detail like that and surprise the reader. If the person is a is a an upholsterer, art mechanic, or something, and you pull out that they play the flute or did when they were a kid. Um, home life. So what was the home life like in family of origin? And then what's the home life like now? And see their backstory. People sometimes don't see the need to roll up their sleeves and get in there and see what was going on in family of origin. But these things will recur. They'll come up. They'll be part of the characters, kind of the the loam out of which a character grows. And they will refer to this from time to time, uh, maybe even in passing, but it gives the dimensionality, the realness to your character that you have put in the effort to think about the home life, think about, you know, relationship with siblings and so on. Uh, IQ, you know, how smart are they? Um, religion. Did they have any religious training? Do they have any religious beliefs? You know, do they have any affiliation? Do they miss the, so the social quality of religious, uh, their family's religious um, uh, uh, affiliation? Do they, did they, were they forced to go and hate it? In hate, you know, I have a character in, um, in the Revolution of Marina M in Chimes of Lost Cathedral, who is a a violent atheist and of course it's because um, he was a priest's son and uh, priest Mary in the Orthodox uh, religion. Uh, community. What is the character's community? So many times we see our characters kind of like uh, little bugs in our microscope and we are not seeing the matrix of their lives, you know, are they in the PTA? Do they avoid the PTA? Are they, you know, where is their community life, if any? Is it at the bar? Um, people usually have some sort of community, even if they don't like it. Um, political affiliations, you know, what are your character's politics? Do they care? Do they, are they head in the sand? Are they, you know, yelling at Fox News? You know, what where are they coming from? Um, amusements, you know, what do they like to do? They, do they like crime movies? Do they, are they into smoking? They're, they, do they dance? Do they like to dance? Do they not like to dance? You know, um, what do they do for fun? What do they read? You know, I know that reading, you know, many people kind of, uh, realtors will look at you, um, uh, Evidently, when, when there are bookcases in a um, house they, that, that, that realtors are showing, they will tell you to take the books out and take the bookcase out if you can. Ah, uh, that's happening. <laughs> but what do they read? I mean, everybody reads something. Do they read a blog on their phone? Do they read fashion magazines? Do they read celebrity magazines? Do they read Guns and Ammo? Do they read Hot Rod? You know, if they are sitting in a waiting room and there's a bunch of magazines, well, which one will they pick? Uh, and then, of course, if they're book readers, you can have a text that becomes a very important text to them, uh, a book that they refer to or a poet they refer to or a writer that they refer to who kind of haunts the book. That's interesting. Um, then there's psychology, and the psychology could include Hey, sex life? What's the sex life like? You know, are they happy? Are they reluctant? Uh, are they embarrassed? Are they the kind of people who can do it but can't talk about it? Are they the kind of people who can talk about it but can't do it? You know, what do they really like? What's really going on with them? Uh, what were their early experiences like? You put this work in to your character in a novel and you are going to have material to work with and you will not feel like you've run out of material. You will always have material. Morality. What's their morality? Do they have a sense of morality? Do they figure, you know, eh, corporation pays for it. What difference does it make if I pocket something? Or is morality absolute? There's some people who can't lie. They can't tell you you're, oh, you know, you're like sitting there with your new haircut. It's like, well, what do you think? You know, and they... <sighs> 
there's certain people who just can't lie. <laughs> they're just like, bruh, it's like, they just die a thousand deaths because in their philosophy, in their moral morality, they would rather kill themselves than lie. So it puts them in a very awkward situation in a society which lying is the currency. Um, what is their morality? Do they care about, you know, is it like the morality of the Corleones where uh, what happens to the family is super important and what happens to people outside the family just doesn't... It's business. You know, there are people, many religious, highly religious people, uh, see their co-religionists as, uh, you know, they're very scrupulous in how they deal with their co-religionists, but anybody outside that circle is just like, pff, they're not even human, they don't even care. Um, morality. Ambition. How ambitious are they? You know, uh, many uh, a... Uh, a family has been enlivened by the ambition of one of its members. Um, you know, sometimes it's not even the person who can make the fortune. Sometimes it's the stay-at-home wife who, or husband who just insists on there being financial progress or social progress uh, in that family. Uh, I, I've seen it. I've seen it plenty, you know, and it's not always as bad a thing as you think it is. Sometimes that person will light a fire under somebody who is capable but kind of torpid. And, um, you know, they'll do something for a girlfriend that they would never do if their parents ask them to. You know, we've all seen that. So ambition. Do they have any ambition? Are they dreamy in their ambitions? Oh, you know, someday I'm going to be, you know, this, that, or the other. Or are they really eye on the prize at all times, you know, no, I can't go out, I've got an exam, I'm going to ace this exam, I'm going to get that National Merit Scholarship, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. Those are very interesting people too. Uh, here's a question. Have you worked with an editor at your publisher where you strongly disagreed with suggestions for your manuscript and how did you deal with it? Um, yes, there are times that you strongly disagree with your editor. And um, if you generally are uh, willing to think about what they're suggesting and use what they're suggesting and stuff, and there are times that you absolutely don't agree, it's your name on the book, not theirs. You know, So you just do what you need to do. Uh, that's how I would deal with it. You know, you don't argue about it. You just say, mm, I don't, I just, not that one. I don't see that one. So here's some other things. Ambition in the character. Frustrations. What are they most frustrated about? Are they most frustrated that um, um, they were turned down for a certain job that they were really qualified to do and they really needed a job and they, this, they had all their hopes on that thing and it fell through? Uh, is there frustration that they never found the great love of their life? Is there foundation, you know, f what is their frustration? They always wanted to be a, an actress and uh, the mother would never give her, give them lessons. What is their frustration? What is their temperament? You know, some people are very quick to anger. Some people are very slow to anger, but when they get there, they're, they go, nu they're nuclear. They never release and then suddenly they they uh, demolish a city. Um, so what, what is their temperament? Uh, the four, this, in medieval times, you, you can go with the four humors, which is uh, the, the sanguine, the melancholic, the choleric, and the, um, and the phlegmatic. So the, the, the um, choleric is like the uh, go get em person. You know, they, they kick obstacles out of the way. They're very self-willed, self-determined. Uh, the temperament, the sanguine temperament is pretty cheerful and is able to go, you know, roll with the punches and uh, get up smiling and find a way to enjoy their life. Um, the melancholic, uh, anything goes wrong, everything is going wrong. They're very quick to despair. 
and the phlegmatic is like Winnie the Pooh is like going along it's a good day and they're they care a lot about food you know is there enough to eat when are we going to eat uh let's it's a nice day to have a picnic so it's always good to have food in your novels for the phlegmatics so those are some ideas of temperaments quick tempered patient uh irritable anxious uh, what is their attitude towards life? Are they confrontative? Are they militant? Um, are they uh, avoidant? Are they procrastinators? Do they make excuses for themselves? Do they have complexes? Um, superiority complex? They feel they're better than everybody. Inferiority complex? They feel they're worse than everybody. Uh, they paranoid. They think everybody's talking about them and looking at them and having ideas about them. Uh, superstitions. So these are things you make a list and you're going to answer these questions about your character just right off the bat. You don't need to talk to them about it. You can just do this. This is the first level. Um, superstitions. It's great to collect superstitions. It's great to give them to characters. And what? how good is their imagination? You know, do they see things coming? Do they guess? Do they, you know, do they jump to conclusions? Do they wait for things to unfold? Are they so thick that even when things unfold, they don't get it? Um, so this is what is meant by the three-dimensional character study, physiology, psychology, and sociology. Here's a question. How do you keep yourself motivated to finish a book? Um, I'm a completist. If I have written a book, I am going to complete it. The motivation is the terror of having put years into a project and have it fail, have it not finish. That's uh, that's how I keep motivated. Um, uh, I I just finish everything that I start. That's something that that uh, I decided a long time ago that. Um, Bet for better or for worse, I wasn't going to have a lot of half-finished product uh, projects lying around. So I wanted to show you what it looked like when you interview your character. So say you get an extra sh shot of information doing the three-dimensional character study. You're going to get tons of extra information from that. Then you interview your character and that's what I want to talk about today you um, what I do is if anybody does create a visualization or meditates or anything like that you get into that quiet state you know I do it lying down with a with a um, uh, a pad of legal paper uh, with me and a and a pen and I put myself out into that really 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 calm state and in what I do, I visualize going down a flight of stairs, counting backwards as you go down the stairs, 10 stairs, 10, 9, 8. And then I walk into a beautiful garden, and I picture myself there as vividly as I can. I, there will be a bench or somewhere to sit. I'll sit down. It's always super comfortable in that place. It's a safe place, good temperature. And then I'll wait for the character to join me. You know, I'll ask for somebody. Say, I'll ask for, um, uh, say, in this, I, I uncovered this material from uh, writing Painted Black. So I'll say, I want to talk to to Michael's father. Uh, I want to see Michael through his father's eyes. I want to understand him dimensionally. So I will interview sometimes uh, minor characters to tell me about major characters and what they see from the outside. So let me show you this. This, this I uncovered uh, when I was going through, my daughter was going through the garage and came up with a box full of stuff. So I'm going to turn this around so you can see. So Painted Black was my uh, second novel, the novel after White Oleander. And these were questions I wrote out for 
at the time, his name was Martin. He became Cal Faraday, Michael's father in Painted Black. And these are questions that I asked him. How do you feel about your son's death? How do you feel? How did you fall in love with Meredith, Michael's father, M Michael's mother? I didn't know the answers to any of these. What ended the marriage? Did you ever try to take your son away from her? How do you, have you heard about his girlfriend, Josie Tyrell? Did you ever meet her? If so, what did you think about her? Did you support Michael behind Meredith's back so that he could get away from her? Did you really call him sissy boy? And if you did, why did you do that? When you go back to, for his funeral, did you, do you spend any time with, his, with your ex? If so, how did it go? When Meredith attacked Josie at the funeral, how did you react? Did you ever try to get a hold of Josie, question her about Michael? So this was probably mm, 60, 70 pages into the book where I began to ask these questions. How many other children do you have? Do you feel guilty for being a bad father? Or do you feel Meredith kept you away from him? I had to answer all these questions to really get a dimensional sense of that father-son relationship. Even though Cal doesn't figure that that much in the story, he does. How many other children do you have? What were you thinking when you married a concert pianist? Uh, what was the reality? I learned a lot about Meredith there. What is your driving emotional need? Why did your son hate you so much? What did he love about you? If he had been more of a boy's boy, would you have stayed in the marriage? What was Meredith like as a mother? Do you suspect mental illness in them both? Where were you when Michael was born? So I was able to an answer he. I got him sitting down. I think we were more at a bar. Uh, <clears throat> but I got him sitting down and answer those questions for me. Uh, then this is questions for Josie, who was my protagonist, a uh, little uh, punk rocker. I was able to write, begin the story, but I had a billion questions and I needed to understand her. So these are questions that I asked my protagonist. What do you see in Meredith? That's, uh, she's a concert pianist. She's her, her uh, boyfriend, Michael's mother. Um, and she becomes enmeshed with Meredith after Michael's death. What, what did you see in Michael? What does Josie see in Michael? These were questions I asked, I think, very close to the beginning. How romantic are you versus how venal are you? Meaning, how much does Josie care about Michael's, uh, Michael being wealthy and cultured versus just the sheer romance of being with him. I needed a, an answer to that question pretty early on. How dangerous are you and in what way? What do you want from Meredith? What do you want from life? And that's a question you should ask every protagonist. If you, what is the most important thing in the world? If you are a real protagonist, because I had three, it started out with three different protagonists, Meredith, Michael, and Josie. So if you are a real protagonist, how do you change in your conflict with Meredith? We, we, when we talked about story, you're always looking for the change in the protagonist. So how do we change? How does she change? I might not have answered to that one, but I'm always thinking about it. Uh, what is your idea of, a, of perfect satisfaction? That's a wonderful question to ask any protagonist. What is the thing you would never do? And that's interesting because if you read Joan Didion's Play It As It Lays, she may, uh, her, her protagonist makes a list of things she would never do and then does all of them. So that's very interesting. What is the thing that threatens your survival? How mentally stable or unstable are you? What is your driving emotional need? This is super important for you to deeply understand your characters. They're not just chess pieces you move around on the board. You need to know these things. Finish the sentence, I would do anything to be blank. 
What is your defining text? Uh, in the relationship between Michael and Josie, the defining text was uh, the Ballad of Reading Jail. Each man kills the thing he loves. Finish, uh, uh, what do you believe in God? It's a question we never ask our protagonists, and we should. Do you believe in perfect love between a man and a woman? How aware are you of humdrum realities? I don't know. I'm just getting to know my character. Do you love Michael, or were you using him? Well, that question was answered. Um, are you an angry person? Are you a desperate person? How guilty do you feel about Michael's death? Very. How large is your grief? What is gone now that he is gone? You know, I needed to clarify all of this in my head. What did you get in the relationship with Michael that you had not bargained for? And then look at all this. These are more questions. Did Michael ever propose? What did the right... What did the invite to his funeral look like? Well, she wasn't invited. I figured that out. Um, do you have any phobias? Did you watch... Did you watch Dynasty? <laughs> God knows. Um, so anyway, this is the qu these were the actual questions I asked myself in creating... Um, in creating Paint It Black. And Linda says, did you see the movie? I just watched it last night. Yes, I did see the movie, and it is wonderful. Um, here is Mer questions for Meredith. Look how, wow, this really survived a lot. And I have these for every book that I've written, but this is what Chimes of a Lost Cathedral, uh, my quote-unquote files, I'm going to turn around so you can see behind me, See all this paper? That is notes. That is all notes and drafts and stuff, and not all of it. There were three boxes as well. So I wasn't able to go through and find these questions for Chimes of Lost Cathedral or, or uh, The Revolution of Marina M. Uh, but, they're in, but everything that I have written has these kind of questions. So this is questions for Meredith. And use any of these questions, please. Use them in good health for your own uh, uh, character studies. Does the public know that your child committed suicide or did you hush it up? You know, I needed to know that. Uh, in your relationship with Michael, were you the authority or was he? Did you always worry about his mental health or only your own? How dangerous are you and in what way? What do you want from Josie? What is the most important thing in the world? Everybody has their own most important thing in the world. What is your driving emotional need? How mentally stable or unstable are you? Always, for me, a necessary question to ask my protagonist. Do you believe in perfect love between a man and a woman? How do you feel about Michael's relationship with Josie? Was she using him to get to you? Why did you call the police on Josie? What did you want from Michael? Are you still in love with Martin, although Cal is, he was renamed Cal? Did you cancel your South American tour when Michael killed himself? How do you feel about money? That's a huge one, obviously. How did your father feel about your marriage to Martin, to Cal? Important question. He was dead by then. What is your sex life like? How narrow or general is your culture and intelligent? intelligence? Are you just a pianist or do you champion the larger culture? I think that many people who are prodigies in one area, especially if they begin very, very young, like a pianist will begin at maybe at three, they don't have much of a sense of the wider world. Um, just they're, they're part of it. You know, they know their piece deeply, but, you know, sometimes they don't even, they barely literate. Was motherhood hard for you? What was the hardest thing about it? Why are you so cold? What is the piano to you? You can see that you get questions, these questions um, 
If you get answers to questions like this, you are going to have such a beautiful, multi-dimensional picture of your character. And you might use it just in a phrase. You might use it just in a side. You know, like, did the public know your child committed suicide or did you hush it up? Once I had an answer to that question, then I could have a man come up to Meredith in a restaurant and say that he was sorry to hear about her child's death because I knew that it would be out there. Who was her teacher? I had to do research. How did the piano figure in your relationship to your father? who was a composer. If you could live at any time, what time would you live in? If you could, what composer? It's important to draw a picture of a, of a, uh, uh, of a pianist. You want to know which composer would you go back and meet? Who would, you know, who, who's her favorite? What's her favorite country, her favorite tour? What's the nomadic life like? How did you think you could have a child? Uh, how did you live with Michael on the road? That's where we had to create a character who would travel with her. Um, when did you leave him and when did you take him? She always took him. What frightens you about Josie Tyrell? Do you think you were a good mother? And how far will you go in your hatred of Josie Tyrell? So in every, you can feel free to use, let's turn this around. So feel free to use any of these questions uh, to ask your characters um, and really have a conversation to find out how they see it because every character is going to see things differently and you're going to get detail that you would not have, you know things you don't even know that you know. But until you ask the question, you're, you're not going to, have that in consciousness and be able to use it in your novel. Um, Linda says, I, I thought there was a common theme of narcissism running through both mothers in White Oleander and Painted Black. They're both artists. And artists, it, it's probably sad but true, or maybe not sad, or maybe not, you know, always true. But artists have to pay a lot of attention to the inner world, to their own inner life and the, the life of the mind. And they live in a different world while they're doing that. And so it is very easy for a, an artist, especially a driven artist like both uh, Ingrid and Meredith, um, to see the world, to see the world. And Meredith didn't have much experience about the world that wasn't about her. She was a concert, she was a concert pianist and she, um, it was all about her. It was very, very difficult to be her. She worked like a dog from a very, very early age in a very focused way, but in every other way she was catered to. So she wasn't even a fully an adult when she had Michael. So she, narcissism is, you know, yeah, completely self-referential. And Ingrid didn't have much to give except um, the product of her processing of herself and herself in the world. Uh, she didn't have the ability to look at another person and see a complete being. She saw people only in the sense of, are they or are they not a mirror uh, of myself? So um, both of them had been damaged in different ways. Uh, but I don't think all artists are that way. Um, Astrid certainly wasn't. Marina certainly isn't uh, in The Poet in Chimes of Lost Cathedral. Um, uh, Linda says, you're an artist and you're not a narcissist. Well, um, I have enough of that in me to recognize it. Uh, I try to steer away from it. I really try to stay present with other people and, and uh, you know, really feel what it is to be in their condition. I don't think that you can be um, the kind of writer that I am 
uh, and be a complete narcissist because, you know, a lot of it is caring about how other people live and noticing the world. There's two kinds of artists. There's the kind of artist who sees the world as a mirror of themselves, and there's a kind of artist who sees the world as uh, existing, and our, our job is to um, notice, observe, process, make conclusions. It's like inductive and deductive reasoning. Um, I don't expect the world to reflect my ideas about it. Um, but I, I have a bit of that in me. I can, I can access it. But I'm more than just that. You know, I, I try to live, a, a, I live a pretty conventional life, and I do, I can indeed look at people and imagine my way into their lives. Because I ask questions, you have to ask, be curious. You know, a true narcissist is not curious about other people, could care less. And uh, that is not uh, the way I live in the world. Um, yes, we are. Uh, so um, anyway, this is how I, have you ever had a story idea, but your characters are fuzzy? Stories come in from all kinds of directions. And, uh, you know, it could be a place, it could be an assignment that you get uh, to write about a place or a period or something like that. Um, they all have to come into focus. So I could have a story idea and like right now, I'm working on a character, and I could see a story using a, a, a kind of a range of character traits from my protagonist, and I've got to decide which one uh, m makes the story, will work for the story, because if story is, you put pressure on a character and their characteristics, and the story results from that, then you have to align the characteristics so that the story that you want will emerge. Otherwise, a completely different story will emerge, uh, depending on who the character is. So it's always this character or orchestration. Um, but I do believe in, I do know, let's just say, that many writers get to the end especially novelists, they get to the end of what they know about the character and they panic. So I've gi given you two sets of questions to ask yourselves about your character that hopefully will enable you to finish your books. Uh, and so hang in and when you don't know what happens, interview a character, interview a minor character, often can tell you, give you some information that you, your major character might not think of. You know, I had somebody ask me a question when they were making White Oleanders a film. Um, the director asked me, um, you know, we see Astrid from her own point of view, but we never see her from anybody else's point of view. If I was a teacher in her, in a classroom, what would she look like to me? And boy, it was like I had never thought about that. Um, I realized, oh, she would be quiet. She wouldn't. She wouldn't cultivate friendships. She would be seem somewhat mature for her age. Very quiet, but always know the answer. Um, kind of a little apart. Always shabby. You know, the shoes don't fit. The clothes are too small. You know, the. Um, but eager to learn and ab very able is how I would see it. So, uh, these are some questions when you're developing character uh, to ask yourself, and, uh, and I uh, hope you've had a good Writing Wednesday. Um, thank you so much. Okay, bye.